For the past five nights in News Extra, we've heard an extraordinary story told by a desperate man. John Wayne Gacy is trying to rewrite history and retry his case. Tonight, Gacy's story focuses on the house on Summerdale. For years, it was his home. As Channel 2's Walter Jacobson is here to tell us, it is the center of Gacy's case and all of his alibis. Walter? Linda, as you know, it was the house on Summerdale that he buried 26 of the 33 bodies. It was his home and his office as well. And he now says there was so much going on inside that house that any number of people could have been involved. There's a uh, misconception of what the, the house on Summerdale is. It's not a house where you work nine to five and come home, and it's, it's like a house where you live in. The living room was, was a major, was the private office section. One of the bedrooms was a terrarium. The kitchen was more like a, a, a fast food kitchen. He's painting a picture of a busy place, but conveniently omitting the crawl space, which he divided into plots like a cemetery, numbers one through 26, six feet by about three feet and a foot and a half deep. That was under the house. Up above 8213 West Summerdale was not only where Gacy lived, as he says, but headquarters for his company, PDM Construction, and a flop house for PDM employees, upon whom Gacy is now laying the blame for the murders. We have always contended there was, there's others involved. At the, at the time, at the time of my arrest, uh, there was four other suspects. Three of the suspects that we knew that they knew then was uh, Michael Rossi, David Cram, and Philip Paskey, all employees of PDM contractors, all with keys to the house on Summerdale. And they had friends, Gacy says, and friends of friends, as he weaves for me an alibi. There was Michael Rossi, for one, who worked for PDM and actually lived there during the time of the murders. Gacy and Rossi socialized in the house with Johnny Zick, Victim number three, the night he was murdered. I met him the night he was killed because I met him with Michael Rossi. I had a drink with the two of them, and then I left. And when I next seen the individual, he was dead. Where did you see Why him? didn't I say something about it? Because it wasn't my business, and I stayed out of other people's business. Where did you see him dead? In the house on Summerdale. And did Rossi tell you who had killed him? No, Rossi didn't say nothing. Rossi was sleeping on the couch. I, I just left. And how did he get buried? You know? He was buried in the crawl space. When I come back, he wasn't there. So, Walter, that's your guess as to who put him in the ground in that. Casey finds a corpse in his living room and doesn't say anything because it's not his business? Well, if you don't believe that, he has another story about being so high on drugs, he didn't know what he was doing. No, I started back in 1984. I started taking 10 milligram of Valium, and by the time 1978 came around, I was doing 130 milligram of Valium. But then I was moving 80 jobs a year, and I was working 16, 18 hour days, and I, I just had to have something to take the pressure off. So the next thing people wonder is what about the smell in the house of decomposing bodies? Casey has a lasso opso story for that. When I was arrested, um, they claimed, well, there was a putrefied odor in the house. And I contend that was a lot of hogwash, too, because one officer, Schultz, claims on the 18th or on the 19th, that as he came into the house, we had come into the house and my little uh, Lassa Opso was in the house. And of course he had been locked in the kitchen, you know, all day. Well, the little puppy, he piddles, see, and, and while he's piddling and while he is uh, doing his business on the paper, and that, you can imagine what it smells like if you go into a closed room. And when the heat came on, as soon as the heat came on, it'd give you, you know, that strong feces odor. Or if not the dog, maybe just the house itself. How about the sump pump? You know, I found it as odd when we bought the house that a house with a crawl space would need a sump pump. But then I learned the first time it rained that this ground gets wet under there and the, and the crawl space actually floods up to a foot deep in water. And then as it recedes, it puts out a musty odor. There was always a musty, musty odor in that house. These excuses and the ones we've heard all week are the bases for Casey's appeals, which are expected to go on for another two years, maybe three, before his death sentence is carried out. What have 13 years of thinking about that done to John Gacy? Nothing, he says. Nothing at all. I'm just as lovable and jokeable as I was back then. You know, I don't, I don't sit around worrying about the death penalty or things like that, no. How could you not? If you believe you've lived your life the right way, then you do not have nothing to fear in my case. You're not worried about facing God? No. I'm fairly comfortable with him. I've been a, the, uh, at the Catholic services. I'm the server. 
for the priest for the last 10 years. I have no qualms about doing that. I've had confession. I have communion. And, and I, I am at peace with myself. That's what he says, that he's at peace with himself. But he seemed to be, to me, to be highly agitated and very frightened about death. He says he's religious, so how could he not be afraid of death or what will happen to him after death? Clearly, John Gacy's afraid enough to be doing whatever he can to avoid his execution, making up new excuses, denying his involvement, trying now to involve others, anything to open his case and prolong his life. But given the facts of the case, no matter what he does, it won't be enough. And then, Bill? Mm. Walter, thank you. Very interestingly.